What I thought when I looked at this speech was that this was a peculiar speech in the sense that it looked backwards the whole time. It was almost like a refight of the referendum. All the same threats and issues that came up during Project Fear were all in here. Uh, strangely bitter, really, and almost really the speech of someone who simply refuses to accept uh, that the British people should have made a decision such as they did and wants them almost to rerun it again until they get it right, which is rather sad, really. He doesn't seem to question the result, but he does say there's a growing concern <coughs> the British public have been led to expect a future that's unreal and over-optimistic, that obstacles have been brushed aside. He's basically asking Brexiteers to be more honest with the British public instead of pretending it's some walk in the park. I don't think anyone's pretending this is a walk in the park. Theresa May, least of all, she's the one that's going to do the negotiations. I think the important thing from this is that I think she's uh, taken this on in a very realistic way. What she's saying is the British people voted to leave. We must now deliver that. But obviously, at the end of it all, we want a decent relationship with Europe. After all, we're leaving uh, the European Union. We're not leaving Europe. Actually, the speech was full of unrealistic, really rather angry threats. And I can't really see the point in that now. I mean, 68, 69% of the public the other day in a poll voted to get on with it. What did so you they're not looking back. Threats? Well, the, the, the almost rerun of the things that are going to go wrong. Oh, it's all going to be terrible, you know, it's going to be a disaster, there's nothing you can do, you're being too optimistic. And what's the alternative? That you go in and you say to the European Union on negotiations, this is all going to be terrible, help us out, this is a disaster, it's miserable. That's not exactly the way to run a, a negotiation. No, but when you look back at some of the rhetoric <coughs> that has been used, John Redwood saying there'll be no economic damage, Boris saying that <coughs> countries have been <coughs> queuing up to be our trade partners, Michael <coughs> Gove saying our best <coughs> days are ahead. What he's saying is don't promise, otherwise you will create a distrust all over again between the public and politicians. Well, I don't think the public expects uh, this to be a complete walk in the park. But, but the way I, it's sold, they well, would. Well, I'm not so certain about that. I think that if you look at carefully what's being said, what people are saying are that it's in the hands of the British people to do the best out of this and actually do well. But it's in our hands. It's not in somebody else's hands now. And that's the point. You can be optimistic going forward because you believe that the British people are capable of remarkable things. But to be pessimistic about them, I think, is the wrong attitude. And I got from this speech a deep pessimism about the idea of the UK outside the European Union. But we've had that debate. We've had that vote. And the point I'd simply make is, and I'm really sorry that he's chosen to couch this in really what I consider to be quite bitter terms about the process and such a depressing forecast about the future. It would be far better that he should actually say, like the British people have already made their minds up, let's get on with this. Let's make the most of this. Let's do the best. And at the end of the day, an ex-Prime Minister of the United Kingdom should have a little more faith, I think, in he, the British people than he seems to have. He points his finger at <clears throat> the Brexiteers who have shouted down disagreement, <clears throat> who claimed to want Parliament to have sovereignty, yeah. and yet have taken issue with anyone that has asked about amendments, that have questioned how Brexit will happen. That's crazy, isn't it? Well, that's the nature of debate, isn't it? I mean, are we now but saying... But that's what he says. He says that you have shut yeah. it down, that you talk about frustrating the will of the British people or calling it a slap in the mm. face if the Lords well, debate it, talking about their shenanigans. He's saying yeah. you have shut down debate. But uh, with a bit of respect to uh, John Major, I was here 25 years ago when the Maastricht Treaty was being pushed through. I seem to recall he and many of his cabinet shouted down those who were concerned about Maastricht, which has turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. So <clears throat> I think a little bit of humility in this might not be a bad thing. The reality is that is the nature of robust debate. You know, we're going to have this huge reform bill coming through in which everything is going to be debated ad nauseum. And then people are going to get a vote at the end of it on whether or not they actually think they agree with the agreement that the Theresa May brings forward. So Democracy. when he says Brexit cheerleaders have shown a disregard that amounts to contempt <clears throat> for the 48% of those who voted remain, you don't call that a disregard for what they're saying. You're encouraging them to do that, are you? Encouraging no, them encourage to argue everybody the to debate. Encouraging. I'm very happy with debate, I think that Why do you those call who voted the face, then? Why do you call voted, it shenanigans? Those who voted leave will have their own opinions about where we go in the future and I, I, I relish that. I mean you only test things by having debate. And, and I, amending I, I, if you need to after the debate, well, presumably. What are you going to amend? Uh, the difference is are you going to amend this single short little bill that says we want to trigger Article So there's 50? no point in having a debate then. But you've got behind that a massive Massive bill. You can have a go at amending that ad nauseum. Why do you think John Major entered the debate at this point? What's your message for him? 
Well, I don't really know why he chose to speak. I would have hoped that had John Major spoken, he might have been a, a lot more positive. He might have actually said, look, there are going to be difficulties, but you know, here's how I would do it. This is what I would do. I think these are the things you can achieve. This is what we should be aiming for. I felt today's speech was a lost opportunity for someone who was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, rather like Tony Blair, not harking back to what happened, not sounding bitter and angry, not looking like you don't have a lot of respect for what the British people are capable of doing and making the wrong decision. And instead of which saying, look, we can do these things. Uh, you know, we have faith in the British people. After all, you know, when we were elected in 1992 and John Major became the Prime Minister, I don't recall he turned around and said, I really don't have a lot of time for the British voters. They seem to have made the wrong decision. I think he accepted their decision. Duncan Smith, thank you very much. Thank you.